with an unusual high-tech oil drilling rib that's been at work off the coast of Cuba departed last week, headed for either Africa or Brazil. With it went the island nation's best hope, at least in the short term, for reaping the share of the energy treasure beneath the sea that separates it from its long-time ideological folk. For many Floridians, especially in the Cuban-American community, it was welcome news this month that Cuba had drilled its third unsuccessful well this year and was suspending deep water oil exploration. Related pictures, for offshore drilling frontiers while some feared an oil spill in the Straits of Florida, some 70 miles 113 kilometers from the U.S. coast, others were concerned that drilling success would extend the reviled reign of the Castros, longtime dictator Fidel and his brother and hand-picked successor, Rubble. The regime's latest efforts to bolster their tyrannical rule through oil revenues was unsuccessful, said U.S. Representative Ileana Roscommon Lettinen, a Florida Republican who chairs the House Foreign Affairs Committee, in a written statement. But Cuba's disappointing fa rate into deep water doesn't end its quest for energy. The nation produces domestically only about half the oil it consumes. As with every aspect of its economy, its choices for making up the shortfall are sorely limited by the 50-year-old United States trade embargo. At what could be a time of transition for Cuba, experts agree that the failure of deep water exploration increases the Castro regime's dependence on the leftist government of Venezuela, which has been meeting fully half of Cuba's oil needs with steeply subsidized fuel. Related, Cuba is new now and it means Cuba will continue to seek out a wellspring of energy independence without U.S. technology greatly increasing both the challenges, and the risks. Rigged for the job. There's perhaps no better symbol of the complexity of Cuba's energy chase than the scare of the 09, the $750 million rig that spent much of this year plumbing the depths of the Straits of Florida and Gulf of Mexico. It is the only deep water platform in the world that can drill in Cuban waters without running afoul of U.S. sanctions. It was no easy feat to outfit the rig with fewer than 10% U.S. parts given the dominance of U.S. technology in the ultra-deep water industry. By some reports, only the Scarabi 09S blowout preventer was made in the United States. Owned by the Italian firm Sipem, built in China, and outfitted in Singapore, Scarabi 09 was shipped to Cuba's coast at great cost. They had to drag the rig from the other side of the world, said Jonathan Benjamin Alvarado, the University of Nebraska professor and expert on Cuba's oil industry. It made the wells incredibly expensive to drill. Leasing this Emil submersible platform at an estimated cost of $500,000 a day, three separate companies from three separate nations took their turns at drilling for Cuba. In May, Spanish company Repsol sank a well that turned out to be non-viable. Over the summer, Malaysia's Petronas took its turn, with equally disappointing results. Last up was state-owned Petróleos de Venezuela PDVSA on November 2. Grandma, the Cuban National Communist Party daily newspaper, reported that effort also was unsuccessful. It's not unusual to hit dry holes in drilling, but the approach in offshore Cuba was shaped by uniquely political circumstances. Benjamin Alvarado points out that some of the areas drilled did turn up oil. But rather than shift nearby to find productive if not hugely lucrative sites, each new company dragged the rig to an entirely different area off Cuba. It's as if the companies were only going for the big home runs to justify the cost of drilling, he said. The embargo had a profound impact on Cuba's efforts to find oil. Given its prospects, it's doubtful that Cuba will give up its hunt for oil. The U.S. Geological Survey estimates that the waters north and west of Cuba contain 4.6 billion barrels of oil. State-owned Cuba Petroleo says undiscovered offshore reserves all around the island may be more than 20 billion barrels, which would be double the reserves of Mexico. But last week, Sparabi 09 headed away from Cuban shores for new deep water prospects elsewhere. That leaves Cuba without a platform that can drill in the ultra-deep water that is thought to hold the bulk of its stores. This rig is the only shovel they have to dig for it, said Jorge Pinion. The former president of the Mako Oil Land in America now part of BP and an expert on Cuba's energy sector who is now a research fellow at the University of Texas at Austin. Many in the Cuban-American community, like Roscommon Lenin and the daughter of an anti-Castro author and businessman, who emigrated from Cuba with her family as a child hailed the development. She said it was important to keep up pressure on Cuba, noting that another foreign oil crew is heading for the island, 
Russian state-owned Zarubezhin Neft is expected to begin drilling this month in a shallow offshore field. She is sponsoring a bill that would further tighten the U.S. embargo to punish companies helping in Cuba's petroleum exploration. An oil-rich Castro regime is not in our interests, she said. Environmental, political risks. But an energy-poor Cuba also has its risks. One of the chief concerns has been over the danger of an accident as Cuba pursues its search for oil, so close to Florida's coastline, at times in the brisk currents of the Straits, and without U.S. industry expertise on safety. The worries led to a remarkable series of meetings among environmentalists, Cuban officials, and even U.S. government officials over several years. Conferences organized by groups like the non-profit Environmental Defense Fund EDF and its counterparts in Cuba have taken place in the Bahamas, Mexico City, and elsewhere. The meetings included other countries in the region to diminish political backlash, though observers say the primary goal was to bring together U.S. and Cuban officials. EDF led a delegation last year to Cuba, where it has worked for more than a decade with Cuban scientists on shared environmental concerns. The visitors included former U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Administrator William Riley, who co-chaired the National Commission that investigated BP's 2010 Deepwater Horizon disaster and spill of nearly 5 million barrels of crude into the Gulf of Mexico. Related quiz, how much do you know about the Gulf oil spill? They discussed Cuba's exploration plans and shared information on the risks. We've found world-class science in all our interactions with the Cubans, said Douglas Rader. EDF's chief ocean scientist. He said, however, that the embargo has left Cubans with insufficient resources and an experience with high-tech gear. Although the United States and Cuba have no formal diplomatic relations, sources say government officials have made low-profile efforts to prepare for a potential problem. But the two nations still lack an agreement on how to manage response to a drilling disaster, said Robert News, a Washington attorney and expert on licensing under the embargo that lessens the chance of a coordinated response of the sort that was crucial to containing damage from the deep water horizon spill, he said. There's a need to get over yesterday's politics, said Rader. It's time to make sure we're all in a position to respond to the next event, wherever it is. In addition to the environmental risks of Cuba going it alone, there are the political risks. Kenyon, at the University of Texas said success in deep water could have helped Cuba spring free of Venezuela's influence as the time nears for the Castro brothers to give up power. Ravel Castro, who took over in 2008 for ailing brother Fidel, now 86, is himself 81 years old. At a potentially crucial time of transition, the influence of Venezuela's outspoke on leftist President Hugo Chavez could thwart moves by Cuba away from its state-dominated economy or toward warmer relations with the United States, said Pinion. Chavez's re-election to a six-year term last month keeps the Venezuelan oil flowing to Cuba for the foreseeable future. But it was clear in Havana that the nation's energy lifeline hung for a time on the outcome of this year's Venezuelan election. Chavez's opponent, Enrique Caprils Radosky, complained the deal with Cuba was sapping Venezuela's economy, sending oil worth more than $4 billion a year to the island, while Venezuela was receiving only $800 million per year in medical and social services in return. So Cuba is determined to continue exploring. Its latest partner, Russia's Rubezhin Neft, is expected to begin drilling this month in perhaps 1,000 feet of water, about 200 miles east of Havana. Pinion said the shallow water holds less promise for a major find. But that doesn't mean Cuba will give up trying. This is a book with many chapters, Pinion said. And we're just done with the first chapter. Related, U.S. to overtake Saudi Arabia, Russia as top energy producer.